I just thought I'd start it. I don't know, Glenn, if you noticed, but we were in a practice session, so I just shifted us over to being um, public, 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 because I've never seen that before, so I didn't want to, in case there was a hiccup, you know, you didn't want to set us back. A Zoom hiccup. <laughs> And Sean joins us from the meadow, apparently. Ooh. Yeah, oh. absolutely. Doesn't it look nice out there. Is that Neyland? Are you up in Neyland? <laughs> this, this is Bald Hills. You guys should come up here. Bald it's Hills, cool. yeah. The flowers. Yeah, I've I've gone up there the last two Mother's Days, and get all the pictures up there. It's great. Hmm. That's your own picture. You took that yourself? Uh, no. I got this from Jill Duffy, I think. Yeah. yeah, she's a good photographer. Yeah, yeah, no, she's given us a lot of pictures. Hi, Tammy, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Good, I'm glad, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we could, um, this is going to be your first meeting, right? Well, I've been to every meeting they've had, but my first meeting on the board. As a, yeah, okay, good, good. Yeah. Is there going to be orientation during this meeting? Um, no, I, I talked to the, I mean, we can talk about it during, no, we're not gonna have an orientation in this meeting. Ginger had suggested that we agendize a discussion about orientation for new members. So you'll see it on the agenda. Yep. That'll be good. Hey, Nick, how's it going? Doing well, thank you. Would that be your restaurant in the background? That would be home sweet home. <laughs> Looks like you were just finishing your last mouthful when you came on screen. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm gonna need some candy to get through today. It's it's been a, <laughs> it's been a heavy couple of ones. <laughs> I had one of the great ironies this morning. Um, last week we did have a, a break in at the restaurant, oh. um, and it 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 could have been way worse. Really, they only took a little bit of cash. It was fine. Um, but I was having a um, kind of a, a security walkthrough uh, with the city and with uh, one of the police captains. And of course, as we walk out the back door to show them where they had broken in, I hear the door latch and locks behind us. And I realized my keys, my phone, and all of my, all of my you know, useful tools are inside. Um, so I, I ended up locked out for a good three hours this morning. Um, and I just enjoyed uh -huh. looking over at the police captain and, and saying, well, I guess, uh, I guess this is secure now. And, uh, asked him for a crowbar at which point he chuckled and wandered off. Um, but it was, yeah, it was just, you know, kind of a surprising way to spend the morning. All right, that's enough story time. Hey, Scott. We have a different view of Scott this morning. Yeah, Scott, you got a big, big uh, system behind you there. No, I'm an amateur radio enthusiast. Are you part of the Are you part of the ham group? Oh, I was part of the Humboldt Amateur Radio Club back in the '80s and '90s, and and um, I haven't been a member for quite oh. some time now because I used to work on Tuesday nights oh. and that's when they'd have their, their meetings. You should rejoin. Oh, I've got too many irons in the fire right now. <laughs> Sean, are you on? You are. Oh. Yeah. Been busy, huh? <laughs> really busy this week. Yeah. And reading about you, Sean. Thanks for trying to save the dog anyway. <laughs> I was sad. Yeah, yeah it was. I'm glad That's, it wasn't more tragic than that. Yeah, wow. it's that the dog things happened to me too many times. Everybody gets out but the animals. It's pretty tragic. Yeah, the cat made it though. <laughs> yeah. They will always be. Use up one of those nine lives. <laughs> it's amazing how many animals we've pulled out of a fire and they die later. Like birds, especially. They just they look like they're fine. All of a sudden they just fall over. 
Ms. Miller Rubio or to Sean, uh, did you have any communication from Mr. Barney uh, in indicating that he was going to attend? I think you're muted, Sean. I can see you talking, but I can't hear you. <laughs> um, he confirmed that he received the invitation. Okay. So I'm not sure if he'll be attending today. Okay. Before we get started, thank you to those who came to our um, orientation for the awardees. It was really nice to have you there and hopefully will help. I know we'll probably talk about it during the meeting, but just thank you while I, while I have you. It was well done. Thank you. Yeah, I like in the, the graphics and stuff that were sent out to them. That was great. I printed those out myself. Okay, I think uh, I'm showing two o'clock, so I think I will call the October 28th meeting of the Measure Z Advisory Committee to order. Uh, the first matter of business is the salute to the flag. You join me, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the United States of America and to the to Republic, the Republic one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Thank God we're not a choir. <laughs> uh, next would be, are there any requests for any modifications to the agenda by anyone? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, this would be the point in the uh, agenda where the public has the opportunity to comment on non-agenda items. So if there's any member of the public that would like to address the committee on an item not on today's agenda, now would be the time. Do we have any such request? Chair, I'm not seeing anybody raising their hand. Um, I will note if there's, oh, and I don't see anybody who has called in. So once we do see people calling in, then we'll give the uh, verbally give the instructions on how to raise your hand and request okay. a comment then. If we have anybody joins us late, I'll give them another opportunity if they haven't joined us at this point in time. Uh, next would be items D on our agenda, which are the discussion items. First of all, uh, we have the pleasure of a new member. Tammy Trent is joining us today. She's a recently appointed alternate member. So Ms. Trent, would you like to introduce yourself and make just some brief comments? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm very excited to be on this committee. I've been to most of the meetings since the beginning and um, the committee's done a good job and I just hope to contribute to that. I'm very happy to be working with all of you. Okay, well, we certainly welcome you. Uh, since you have been to most of the meetings, you probably already know, but I would just like to reinforce that it's been the committee's practice and, and policy that although you're only able to vote in certain circumstances based on the quorum status, We've encouraged the alternates to have a full voice and participate fully in the discussion. So we would encourage you to be a, a total participant in our deliberation process with the exception of voting only when it's appropriate based on the quorum. Thank you. Okay. Next would be the approval of the March 25th, 2021, 2021 minutes. Has everyone had a chance to review the minutes and are there any noted corrections or additions? If none, the chair would entertain a motion to approve the action summary or minutes as submitted by staff. Move we approve the minutes. Okay, I have a motion. Is there a yes, second? Okay. Motion by Mr. Hansel, second by Mr. Cole. Any discussion? 
Any public comment? Not seeing any chair. Okay. All those in favor, please signify, signify by raising a hand. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Next would be uh, discussion items that have been brought forward by members of the committee. Uh, the first is a potential training for new committee members. Ms. Campbell suggested this be included on the agenda. So, Ginger, would you like to speak to your request? Yes, um, since I, Glenn and I have been on since the beginning, um, and we've had, you know, of course, a big turnover of people. And I think that each time somebody new comes on, depending on who, if they were appointed by somebody, they got, you know, asked to be on, they probably got input from that person. And, you know, based on what that supervisor, whatever, would really like to see. But I think overall, if, if it were me and I was in the, had come in in the middle of it, I would be pretty confused about what our role is, what we can and can't do, um, how the county views this. Uh, and I think that it's become an issue where people have, you know, they're really strongly feeling like we need to change the way things are done or that there's things that we can do that we really can't do. And I don't think it's fair to them to, con you know, to jump into the middle of it and, and everybody's looking like, oh, well, you know, that's not really something we can do, especially in the middle of a meeting. And so I really would like to see some type of a, even if it was for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, something like that, where it would be the new person plus maybe their supervisor or, or somebody from, and definitely somebody from the county um, staff, uh, Nefali, or uh, Sean, somebody that can be there. And I mean, we don't have to decide today, but I really feel there needs to be um, an introduction and go over some of the, the paperwork that's been done. I'm, I'm assuming everybody reads the, the ballot measure and does a little history of their own research. But I, I just feel it's fair, more fair to somebody if they get a really good perspective of what our job is and what our goals are um, and what you know we can't I think that in general the people in, in the public feel that we have a, a big say in how things are run within the county which we do not and I think that the person coming on needs to know that and really embrace that too so that when they're looking through the applications they they can see what you know what we're talking about and maybe give them some examples of of applications that have come in that were not even close, you know, just so that they have in their mind, like, okay, I get it, you know, that's not a safety thing. So those are just the things I think could be covered and I would like to see that. Thoughts of the committee members? I agree. Nicholas? Um, I, I think this is really important. Um, especially as we look at uh, the removal of the sunset clause, uh, we are all looking at a situation where somebody else will be sitting in our seats um, at some point. And uh, I, I faced this coming in midstream, uh, not knowing what the process was and having to learn on the fly. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't a terrible experience, um, but it definitely made it more challenging than I think it needs to be. And I think we represent some level of institutional knowledge uh, that I think we can at least trim down to something like a, an hour uh, sit down or an hour discussion that at least informs new members um, to the structure that we're using, uh, to the, uh, the grading system we use and why. And um, I think really introducing concepts uh, as well as examples of, like Ginger mentioned, examples of applications that were absolutely outside of the purview of this committee, as well as uh, examples of applications that were perfect. Um, and I, I, yeah, I would absolutely support um, collecting that information and making that available to, to new committee members um, well before their first meeting. Okay, other thoughts? Ernie? Yeah, I, my uh, experience has been that the Board of Supervisors might need to 
set in on some of these discussions on on training because not so much lately but in the past they have gone past what our recommendations were out into the field of things that we would not ever have recommended and uh, they don't seem to have the background to know that that wasn't something that would qualify in our opinion so i i'm I agree with Ginger that we need a little training going into this thing because I agree with Nicholas also. I kind of stepped into it a little green and just kind of hit the ground running, made a few mistakes going in, <laughs> probably make a few more going out too. But uh, anyway, we do need training for the new members and we could save a lot of a lot of time, I think, just about with a little training. Okay, Bob, you were also wanting to speak. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I agree with what everyone has said, that getting everyone on the same page to understand what the expectations are and what our roles are is absolutely critical for the success of the committee. And I realize that it's taken a number of years for the selection process to be refined to the point of where it is now. And it seems like it's a well-run oiled machine at this point, and that perhaps now is the time to actually document it in writing of sorts where it becomes some sort of, but a lack of words, we'll call it a charter for discussion, that this is, if you will, how the committee operates with all the nuances of what, how applications are judged to see if they even meet the criteria, how then we go into ranking them, how all of that comes into play. And, and that may be something that we're able to put together and without too much difficulty that would then preserve the legacy of the Measure Z Committee moving forward for all of our successors. Okay. I'm seeing pretty universal support for, for the concept. Anybody have any concerns or opposition or any practical concerns? Sean or uh, Ms. Miller-Rubio, do you have any logistics issues or anything like that that you'd like to discuss? It looks like uh, Ginger has something to say, but yeah, I do, I do have some thoughts on this. Okay, go ahead, Ginger. Well, I, when I first thought about doing this was about a year ago and it was too late to bring it up then, but I went through all my paperwork from the very beginning, which if those of you ha had not been here, it was a very interesting <laughs> beginning, but I found some really good documents that were put together that were basic that I would like, you know, we can, I can donate to whoever is going to put this together, but I agree. It needs to be like a little pamphlet or something people can read ahead of time and be a little bit so they, you know, people don't know what question to ask if they don't understand what the process is. So I have stuff to, to participate in that. Yeah, I, I know the committee when we were organizing initially developed some kind of, I'll call them roadmap documents that still exist. Some of mm -hmm. them are still germane, some of them maybe not so much so. So those would certainly right. be available. I get the sense, Ginger, that what you're suggesting perhaps as a member or two of the committee plus a staff representative would be the, the group that would meet with a new member. Am I correctly understanding that? Right. I think if it would be hard to choose a supervisor, you know, because everybody would want to have their say. And I don't I don't feel like it's a thing about having your say about your community or I think it's more like just the basic outline of this is what we do, this is why we do it. This is what we can't do, you know. Don't don't get caught in this because it's not going to go anywhere anyway. You're welcome to say it, but just as a matter of saving time. So I don't know how you guys feel about having a supervisor chosen, but I think that would be really difficult because I think then they'd all want to, you know, they'd all want to participate on some level. Sean would, Sean and yeah, I just I, I would I would have to voice some concerns about involving the supervisors. I, I share Ernie's concern about the supervisors from our perspective going off script a little bit, but I think that's an entirely different issue than the Yeah, that doesn't have anything to do with this. Right? Yeah, that's, that's a different matter than the orientation of our own committee members. So right. I would think a committee member, maybe a committee member, and then the then sitting pre uh, chair or vice chair and a representative from the CEO's office would be a good group to start the process. That could keep it relatively clean and efficient and not make it into something it doesn't need to be. Sean, would, did you have some would, thoughts? Yeah, I would like to recommend, if possible, that the sheriff be on that committee, because that's a big 
portion of Measure Z, and I know that's always been um, just, you know, for background, just to talk about how all that came about where the county got, you know, that amount of money at the beginning, so that that's clear and we don't have to talk about it again when we're on, you know, when we're on the committee, if, if you're willing to do that, Sheriff Hansel, but I, but I feel like that's always the, the big why, you know, why is that there, why do you get all that money and how that works and just let people know ahead of time and not read it in the paper or somebody's letter or something, that's all. Okay. Mr. Quincy? Yeah, so a um, couple things. Um, some of these things <laughs> um, can be handled individually with, you know, cups of coffee with other committee members, lunches with committee members, things like that. Um, when we're talking about Brown Act, we can absolutely provide Brown Act training to members of the committee. Um, we have a, um, there's an online training for the uh, FPPC, the Fair Political Practices Commission, I think is what it's called, um, that we can absolutely send um, to all of the committee members um, for you guys to complete. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but we did hold a Measure Z orientation last week with um, awardees where we can talk about some of these things. How, you know, we did talk about how Measure Z came about and how some of the application process goes and in, in voice submission and, and things like that. Um, and as far as you know, rules of the committee itself, uh, that is definitely something that, you know, us as staff can take on with um, new committee members and talk about things like, you know, what constitutes a quorum, um, how is the chair and vice chair handled and um, when the when the meetings are held and things like that, we can we can absolutely um, handle some of those things. I would be I would be hesitant to um, you know, agendize something like how we um, value different applications because there is still some subjectivity. That is that is why this is an appointed, you are all appointed members to bring your subjectivity into play, but we can definitely talk about the the ranking system and the, the point system and things like that that we've used. Okay. So I guess, first of all, we would have to have a motion to implement this as a kind of a procedure or policy of the committee. And then we could talk a little bit about the logistics of how it would actually be handled. So I, I sense support, but is there a formal motion that we establish? Uh, I, I would say an introductory or orientation program for new committee members. I would like to so move. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there any public comment on the concept? Not seeing any chair. Okay, and discussion amongst the committee members? Or further discussion? Okay, seeing none. I, I, uh, chair, before you vote, can I clarify? This is specifically for new committee members. That was the way it was introduced and, and agendized. So I believe it's it's certainly, I, I think it would make sense if we develop some resource materials and so on, obviously we'd wanna circulate them to all members mm -hmm. just to make sure that that whoever the representative committee members are are correctly conveying the wishes of the, of the group as a whole. But essentially, initially it would be an orientation process for those newly introduced to the committee. Okay. Nicholas? Any material that we put together, I would also like to make available for anybody looking to participate via public comment. Um, is this something that we can make much more available to the public so that they, we can, this can also become a kind of an outreach material so that the public can understand how and why we do what we do? Or is that, is that beyond the scope? Mr. Quincy, your thoughts? So we, as you mentioned, um, Chair and Ginger, when the committee was first established, I know that you all received a packet of information. There was a budget and brief document in there. There was the ballot language. Um, there was uh, you know, Brown Act materials. Um, I think there was FPPC materials in there. 
And so I would be looking to develop a similar packet and yeah, sure, we can, um, we can add that onto the county's website, um, the, uh, the Measure Z website for the, for the Citizens Advisory Committee. Okay, Ernie? Yeah, I would, I would agree with a, some form of a packet with the information that we use, like our ranking system uh, and the Brown Act and a lot, of, a lot of the things that we use could be covered in a pamphlet. And uh, I don't know if we need to have a meeting over a cup of coffee, just a, a really concise pamphlet might be better. It'd be less, less time consuming because a lot of this material is already available. Yeah. Okay, any other discussion prior to a vote? Okay, all those in favor of establishing an orientation or more formal orientation process for the Measure Z Committee, please raise your hand. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, next element obviously would be uh, for the initial process and so on. Uh, Ms. Campbell suggested the sheriff be a member of the committee. I would think that either the chair or the vice chair should be a member and then a representative from the CEO's office. Is that makeup acceptable to the committee? And is it acceptable to the CEO's office? Chair, did you say the sheriff? Either the chair or vice chair and a representative of your office. Okay. Are, are we comfortable with that makeup of the committee at least initially? Okay, so I, I, seeing a consensus, I don't feel the need for a formal motion unless somebody needs needs to make that motion. So uh, perhaps uh, we can ask the CEO's office to communicate with myself and, and Sheriff Hansel and we'll try to set up a little organizational meeting sometime in the relatively near future. Uh, Ms. Trent, obviously you would be the first subject of our, our process. <laughs> Uh, and please don't think we're picking on you at all. I'm sure the goal, I know the goal of the committee is to try to provide some orientation materials and, and just try to give you the benefit of the seven years experience we've had. So we will try to coalesce that into a, a package of information and so on. Uh, then we'll probably circulate that to the committee members just to make sure they're all comfortable with it before we actually schedule what I would imagine to be an hour, hour and a half, hopefully in face meeting of, of the parties. Does that sound reasonable? Nobody's screaming no, so let's let's move forward on that basis. Okay, uh, next would be item D4, County Administrative Office updates. Okay, um, really quickly, um, I'm sure as all of you know, um, Alicia Hayes, who uh, chaired or staffed this committee um, for a long time from its infancy really, and grew this up into the mature um, adult that it is now is, um, yeah, earlier this month was formally appointed as the county administrative officer. Um, she took over as the acting county administrative officer in July. And um, yeah, just a couple of weeks ago, um, she was appointed to the permanent position. I think she's still getting some communication. Um, she's getting CC'd on you know, emails and things like that. So we will continue to try to straighten that out. But uh, Neftali and myself will be staffing this um, committee for the foreseeable future. So. Um, hope you guys are okay with that. Um, and let's see, uh, I mentioned it just a second ago, but last week we held an orientation for the awardees for fiscal year 21-22. Um, it lasted just a little bit over a half an hour. We had um, a good um, attendance. Uh, you know, one of the goals that we wanted to get across to the awardees was um, just clarifying some of the processes that they have to do um, to get uh, reimbursement. And we also went over with them some of the um, key points in the Measure Z audit. Um, you know, and we'll talk about, I guess we have that as a, yeah, as an item. So we went over some of those things to make sure that uh, those uh, issues get addressed. Um, and we also talked about the importance of um, sharing information, sharing what they're doing with Measure Z funding. Um, you know, I'm of the strong belief that one of the primary reasons that Measure Z was supported by the community is because we continue to operate in such a transparent manner 
And um, everybody who has received funding has gone the extra mile in terms of communicating uh, what they're doing with that funding. Um, and so we want to continue that practice. It's a, it's a really great tradition that we have. Um, and uh, the last point I'll mention in the staff updates is that we are, uh, if you've seen some of the um, board agendas lately, we are in the middle of negotiations at the moment. Um, I can't talk about what's happening in those thing, in those uh, negotiations, but uh, we are um, negotiating with several different bargaining groups right now. And uh, we're hopeful that um, those will be resolved um, shortly. That's all I've got for today, folks. Any questions or requests for clarifications from any of the committee members? Okay, we would move on to D5, the update on the 2021 actuals and the fiscal year 21-22 adopted budget. All right, so um, as you all know, the uh, 2021 budget was adopted um, right as COVID set on. Uh, nobody knew what to expect. Um, and so our uh, estimated revenues were much less than what uh, they had been in the past. The budget was adopted with $9.47 million in estimated revenues. Um, during the year, um, we continue to see revenues come in beyond projections. There's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, I've mentioned to this committee, online sales, changes in uh, rules that apply to online real retailers and just behavior. Um, and so we adjusted the budget in March to, um, uh, our revenue projections to just over $11 million. Um, to date, uh, our, the revenue that we have received to date for 2021 is over $13 million. So that is fantastic news. That is funding that we can use, um, I believe in this funding cycle for 22-23. Um, it's kind of the same story with 21-22. We, um, Estimated revenue for 21-22 at $12.5 million. As you all know, um, we were able to fund um, all of the projects that came in, except for a few that uh, had some complications. Um, but right now, our projections have us um, around $13 million again for 22-23. So there should be plenty of revenue um, to allocate uh, in the next budget cycle. Um, I will say, uh, for fiscal year 2021, we do not know where expenditures are landing. Um, typically, our books are closed this time of year. Um, we're still we're still waiting for those numbers to be finalized, but uh, hopefully, we'll have a clearer picture uh, by the time we meet again in um, in January. Okay. Questions from committee members? Any public comment? Ernie, go ahead. He was, uh, Sean was talking about uh, online taxing. Are we getting our full measure of sales tax from the online sales now? I mean, if they regulated that better than they have in the past. And Much what, better. Has the yeah. local, uh, local sales tax dropped and the online sales tax gone up? Yeah, there's... Um... So the behavior of both has been interesting. Um, locally, we are seeing um, sales tax is still keeping pace. In the urban, more urban areas, LA and San Francisco, their local sales tax, their, their Prop 172 taxes have dropped you know, for, uh, for COVID. Um, but locally, we, we haven't seen that happen um, nearly to that extent. And in fact, it's been the opposite. Um, online sales, uh, the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration um, change, has changed its rules a couple times over the last couple of years. Um, so instead of the big benefit for Measure Z is that um, online sales, the tax goes to the area where the products are delivered strictly for measure Z tax. It acts a little bit differently for the, um, for the Bradley Burns 1% tax. Um,
but as far as Measure Z goes, we are um, reaping the benefits of those changes. And that is because precisely it is a local tax and not the 1% tax. I, yeah, I understand that the, for a long time, the online sales just yeah. totally skated on the tax and yeah. uh, just didn't quite seem fair to the local areas. Yeah. And thank you, Sean. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Any public comment or questions? None. Any chair. Okay. All right. We will move on then to item D6, which is the discussion uh, based on a request of one of the committee members of the establishment of a micro grant program. Just by way of foreshadowing this a little bit, as you recall, Supervisor Wilson had introduced this concept a Excuse couple of years. Sorry, we um, passed item D6, the Measure Z audit. I'm looking at my agenda and D5 is, con excuse me, D4 is county administrative updates. D5 is update on actuals adopted. D6 is establishment of a micro grant program. Am I looking at the wrong agenda? Are you, uh, yeah, the agenda on our website has review of the Measure Z audit as. I okay, I, I'm sorry. I, I took the one that was included as attachment uh, on one of the emails. So give me the correct title then. I'm sorry, I don't have that other document available. Okay. It is, uh, yeah, review of the Measure Z audit is the name of the, um, is the name of this item. Okay, I'm sorry. I like I said, I worked off of a document that was an attachment, apparently an incorrect one. Okay. Did the did the committee get a chance to review that, the Measure Z audit? Yes. Okay. Um, Chair, I'll make sure I'll make sure to follow up with you um, after this and make sure that you get a copy of that. Okay. And, um, but um, so as you know, um, was it, I think it was in the 2021 cycle, um, we funded a, um, an audit of Measure Z activity um, and that audit just came in recently, um, a couple of weeks ago, I believe. Um, and this audited activity from July 1st, 2015 through June 30th, 2018. Um, I'm uh, happy to report that there were no um, major findings in the audit. Um, you know, this audit is publicly available, so you know uh, people can take a look um, for uh, can take their own review. Um, the biggest takeaway for me. Um, were a couple of the findings. The first finding showed that um, some of the court, the quarterly reports, there's a space for our office to sign confirming that we've received um, the reports and that that hasn't been done. So we can, we'll modify our processes to make sure that signature is, is on the page. Um, there were uh, other findings about missing invoices and missing receipts from um, um, awardees, uh, people who are receiving funding. Um, that was one of the stresses of our orientation um, last week is that um, the agencies who are receiving this funding need to only submit to us the invoices in order to receive reimbursement. However, we have in our MOUs with these agencies that they are required to retain um, for, I believe, five years. Neftali, is that right? Three years from the date of the last reimbursement. So basically from the end of the fiscal year, which they're funded for three, three years beyond that. Three years. So um, they, they need to retain this supporting documentation for an, for an additional three years after the end of the fiscal year and the year that they are awarded funding. Um, so those are, those, are big, those are big issues. A lot of this, and I will say a lot of this was um, back in 2015 and 2016, where a lot of these findings come from, we were still operating in a paper-based system. And we've since moved to electronic system. Um, and so some of those paper-based documents just um, likely have just gone missing. 
Um, but now that we're operating with electronic records, um, hopefully that'll help with our record retention as well. Mm. Um, yeah, Ernie? Uh, the, the fundees are required to send in quarterly reports. Is that correct? Is there any place that we can access those to review them? Yes. Or should we? Could we? Yes, that is on the um, on the Measure Z website. We have everything posted. I think through the fourth quarter of last year. Right now, we are receiving first quarter invoices for the current year, um, and I think that the deadline for awardees to get those first quarter reports in, I believe, is the thirty first. So yeah, on our website, the humboldtgov.org slash measure Z, we should have the quarterly reports posted up there. Hey, thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, the last uh, major finding that uh, for me was um, there wasn't a consistent um, methodology for agencies to charge overhead costs that we've established. And so the audit suggested that we establish that and um, we are going to be reaching out to awardees uh, to let them know that um, there's going to be a 10% overhead fee that they're going to be allowed to charge up to, but they're going to need to note that also on their invoices and clearly describe that and show that where their overhead costs are in their invoices. Um, so that was, um, those are the major findings that I came up with. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you all might have. The overhead is just an administrative overhead right. component. Okay. That's correct. Mm -hmm. But the amounts that would be included in the administrative overhead are not in addition to the grant award, they have to be contained within the grant award, correct? That's correct. So it can be no more than 10% of the total grant award. Okay. Any other questions from committee members regarding audit discussion? Questions or comments from any public member? I'm not seeing any, Chair. Okay. All right. Am I correct then that in in the actual agenda, the next item would be uh, the establishment or discussion of establishment of a micro grant program? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this is Ms. Campbell's suggestion as well, so I'll let her speak to it first. Actually, this was brought up a couple of years ago by Mike Wilson. Yes. And um, in the meantime, you know, I've had discussions in the community with a couple of um, a public service public safety agencies that have said that they just don't have a specific project at the beginning of our year, you know, that they, that that's what we're, they think that's all we're looking for is just a specific project. And they don't know what that specific project is at that time necessarily, but during the year, they might have their repeaters go down, which are very expensive. They might have they may need new equipment that falls apart that they weren't planning on. And that if they could have just a $10,000 grant from us, then they would definitely spend it, but it would, and it would be very well documented and it would be very, um, you know, pertinent to our goals and, and what we, you know, what the board would like to spend the money on, but that they, don't feel like they can just come and say, I need this because they don't necessarily know they need it at the moment. So that's why this was brought up. I, the other part was like entrepreneur type grant money, starting new agencies. That was what Mike was kind of talking about, which I don't, you know, that isn't my, my thing, but um, just, you know, the, us to think about, especially law enforcement agencies, the smaller ones or, public safety type agencies that, you know, really do need the money, but they don't have a project in mind. They don't want to hire somebody. They just, you know, but they certainly could use the money during the year. And I don't think any of it would ever be given back because they're always in need of something. So that was why I brought it up. Okay. So just so I understand your concept, 
one of the issues you're addressing is a timing issue and so on. Uh, in, in your mind, is the timing of this micro grant different uh, than the timing of the main awards or explain to me how the temporal element works? No, I, I think that when we give our money, if they, if they just ask for a micro grant, you know, during our funding cycle, that's what that's what they're talking about. Um, not just coming up in the middle of the year or and I know that was one of the things we had talked about the money would be available in a separate account and when people needed something they could come and I don't know who was supposed to choose maybe you Sean <laughs> you know, I don't know who was supposed to come up with a yeah you can have the money type thing but this was specific to some public safety agencies that have stopped asking us for money that really 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 could use it and I suppose you know, it's a, it's a little bit different with the Fire Chiefs Association because they get, you know, they meet and they get a specific amount of money and that's, you know, distributed equally with all of the all of the fire departments, but they may see this as something that they need too. So I don't know if it's opening a can of worms, but I hate to see people that really should be getting help from us not get it because they don't have a specific project in mind at the time of funding. Okay. Thoughts of the committee members? Nicholas? Could you unmute yourself, Nicholas? I succeeded. Um, I, I, I really like this idea. Um, one of the concerns I've had over the past few years is I've seen a reduction in the number of applications uh, that has come to the committee. Um, in talking to several nonprofits in my area, one of the responses that I have heard is that they didn't apply for one because they didn't have a specific project, but for two, they already felt the funds that were going to be available were going to be allocated to pre existing uh, uh, applications or, or returning uh, recurring funds or recurring uh, applications. Um, one thing that I'm thinking about this is for a selection process, if we can ask these agencies how they've used funding in the past for public safety um, and providing examples for that and examples how they would use um, any available funding moving forward as a way to evaluate how we would, we would rank that. Okay, other, other opinions or perspectives? Ernie? Are you talking about establishing some form of a slush fund that would be available for application that we set aside just for that? Well, we're not gonna use the word slush fund, Ernie. I can guarantee you that. Okay. <laughs> some, some- A floating fund. fund. Flo okay, floating fund. <laughs> we'll leave the slush out. Okay. But a floating fund that uh, makes it available for this uh, application, and what would the amount be? Mr. Robertson, you, you are next. Um, so I'm a bit confused about the intent that was brought to us two years ago. Um, my understanding was because we have to prioritize uh, the applications and we have a limited amount of money, which became much more of an issue uh, last year and the year before. Um, the idea for the micro grant was that people who, like Ginger said, are, are have relatively uh, small needs relative to uh, fire chiefs, for example, are still able to apply and have some chance of being awarded uh, monies. I don't think having a discretionary amount that you know you may be able to take advantage of at some point um, meets the intent of Measure Z, and I don't even know if that's legal under the ballot measure. So I have concerns about that. And I think there's uh, plenty of mechanism for public safety already, uh, specifically um, the surveys we provide to the fire chiefs don't require uh, a project per se, but a general need and they're, they're more or less the same every year. So I'm confused about uh, what the intent of this is now and how it's changed since we originally discussed it. And certainly what I'm hearing, um, I, I see a lot of other ways to solve that problem than creating this new complication. 
Okay. Before you respond, Ginger, Bob, go ahead. Why don't you uh, have your comments and then we can broaden the discussion. Uh, two points I'd like to go ahead and bring up. The first one is it seems like this opens up quite a big, huge rabbit hole in the way that projects get funded that if you don't really have a project, how are we able to go ahead and judge to see if it meets qualifications for funding or not when there's really nothing set aside for that? Which then kind of leads into, well, maybe this needs to be, uh, not to use the word slush fund, but some sort of reserve fund that perhaps might just be reserved for the board of supervisors to be able to allocate for whatever emergency use that may need to come up during a fiscal year to, to handle a crisis that a small agency can't quite overcome. And maybe the vetting for use of that money is, is those small agencies need to go ahead and document that their operating capital is below some certain threshold and therefore they could be put on a list that could potentially tap into this revenue should they be able to make a case to the board of supervisors in the future that there might actually be a problem. But with all that being said, it, it seems that we should just stick with the basic concepts of here's the proposed projects that people want to do, here's the proposed funding, and we should vote upon them upon their merits and rank them and provide funding as it's, as it's available. Ernie? Yeah, the way I see it, we're going to have to, if we're going to implement this, we'd have to set funding aside from it, and which would take away from funding for legitimate projects, as uh, Bob just said. We we have projects that we need the funding for out there and we don't have nearly enough money to fund what we've got going. And I agree with Ginger that it would be nice to have some seed money, but I don't see how we can implement it without taking away from what we're doing already. Mr. Hansel. Thank you, Chair. I, I think it's a good concept, but what we have to do is, um, is encourage the, uh, the public safety agencies to apply for you know, just smaller grants if, if or the smaller measures e funds if that's if that's you know if they need to forecast what they may need that funding for i think it's just a it's a very difficult task to to ask um um or to provide an outlet for public safety agencies and there are a lot of them here in humboldt county the ability to say i need ten thousand dollars in an account for the rainy day fund that's going to happen you know this year so I would just uh, I would just encourage uh, each public safety agency to find the needs that fit within the uh, the ballot language, which is again how do we provide essential services to the county, um, and and allow people just to go through the normal vetting process through the Measure Z committee, and they may not get funded in the first round, but as Sean has pointed out, you know the revenues are are. are are a lot higher than expected. And sometimes there's leftover money uh, at the end of the year that these things could get funded, um, you know, at a $10,000 increment, um, you know, based upon the need and the Board of Supervisors approval. Okay. Other committee members comments? Ginger, Ginger do you wanna to respond to any of these since you, uh, for the member who brought this forward, any, any concepts or, is there a misunderstanding of the committee members or anything you'd like to say in response? I think Nicholas had something to say. Okay, go ahead, Nick. Um, I, I, I absolutely appreciate the, um, the concept that, you know, all of these agencies have the ability to apply uh, to Measure Z within the construct that we are already operating in. Um, I think one of the things that I'm trying to, to make clear that I see is um, I'm wanting to make this more accessible to agencies that feel that they are excluded. Um, for example, if we took 0.5% of the current projected budget 
that would represent $65,000. If we just had that amount to say as outreach to small agencies that say, we now have micro grants available with this amount of money, not saying that we're capping it at $10,000, they can take less, but have some sort of mechanism so that these smaller agencies not only feel like it's worth their time to apply, but that they have an opportunity to be heard on a fair on a fair field. Um, I don't know if this is going to come of anything of this committee right now, but I really think this is a conversation that we should continue to have uh, because I think there's a, a discrepancy between what um, what larger agencies are able to access and what's available for smaller uh, community public safety organizations. Other committee members have concepts or ideas they'd like to explore? Is there any public comment on this topic? Sure, it looks like uh, Mr. Binder has his hand raised. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't see you, Scott. You're up in the corner there on my screen. Okay, uh, my opinion on this is that um, <clears throat> I think it, it's an unnecessary, uh, more, more obstacles and more of things that we'd have to go through. Um, I'm not comfortable with having um, your hated word slush or a floating fund going on for the supervisor's discretionary use that could easily be abused. Um, and um, if somebody has a need, then they should just apply for it. I'm um, doing our normal funding cycle, just like everybody else. The application isn't very complicated at all. It requires very little narrative be completed probably in an hour or less, no matter the amount of funding that they're requesting or how little funding they're requested they're requesting. And so um, I'm not sure that this uh, micro grant concept is practical as, as we're discussing now. Mr. Robertson. I appreciated uh, Nicholas's uh, clarification that it helps uh, ease my confusion. I, th I think his intent for that type of micro grant uh, does make sense if we have to prioritize things, but I still would be uh, concerned about the process and how that would still meet uh, the ballot language for the measures. So I, I also look forward to further discussion and um, thank you. Is there any public comment or anyone like to comment on the concept? None? Yeah. Chair, um, I would, so I appreciate the, um, the conversation. Um, I would just like to remind the committee that there are, um, there are administrative costs to um, additional tasks like this. Um, every awardee who um, who gets Measure Z funds needs to have a contract developed. They need to submit all this paperwork. We need to process all their invoices. There is there is definitely a cost to uh, to our office and to the rest of the county to process um, additional things like that. I don't want to say that to dissuade you all from um, from pursuing an idea like this, but I do want to. Um, make sure that uh, you that that cost is is realized because that is a real cost to us um, and to the public. Um, and I would um, recommend against um, having awards for something like this done at separate times of the year relative to the rest of the uh, Measure Z awardees. Um, again, just for matters of cost, if we could do the contracts all at one time, um, that really helps our process. We've adjusted kind of our office to, to doing that at, at one time of the year. Um, but, uh, you know, that said, that's, um, uh, Sean, I hear your concerns about making sure that this fits within the, the ballot language. Um, if your committee so chooses, we can do some research on potential um, ways to make this work and bring that back to your committee in, in January. Um, 
if your if your committee uh, would like to go that go down that route. Okay. Just the, the sense of the chair at this point is that there is not a majority, uh, at least express majority, for making a recommendation to the board of supervisors at this point in time. Uh, so the the question to the committee then basically is: Do we want to? even open the topic with the Board of Supervisors. Obviously, it would require their approval to establish this sub-grant program. So uh, just based on the discussion so far, my sense is th that the majority of the committee is not interested in doing that at this point in time. Am I misunderstanding the sense? And I've heard no formal motion to, to move forward with it. So is the chair mischaracterizing kind of the discussion so far? And would anybody like to make another comment? Bob? The recommendation that I think the committee should perhaps move forward with is that the item potentially has merit, but it has yet to be vetted out to be viable. And perhaps it should just be tabled until the proponents who wish to have such micro grant can come forward with a viable program if you will, for the committee to review and see if it's something that could be implementable. I don't think it's something where the CAO's office necessarily needs to get in the middle and try to create something, but there was a vision that was coming from the board and from other entities about what this might be, and perhaps it should just be kicked back to those entities that wish to see this to develop something truly in the spirit of Measure Z, considering all the input that's been discussed today, and then perhaps that's something that the committee could look at at some point in the future. But until that time, I'd recommend that we leave status quo. Scott? I think it might be a good idea to get Mike Wilson in here and hear what he has to say about it. Since he's been proposing it for the last couple of years, he's likely given it a lot more thought than we have and might uh, be able to provide some insight that we haven't heard from our committee yet. Okay. I was going to suggest that there's kind of two, two levels of discussion here. There's a discussion of our interest, but clearly to modify the process, it would have to have support at the Board of Supervisors level. That hasn't been the case, at least historically. I don't know if anything has changed at the board level now, uh, just as a way of kind of bringing this to some sort of reasonable conclusion, would it make sense to ask the CEO's office to communicate uh, to the board of supervisors that this discussion took place and that there was you know, no conclusion reached at this point in time, but indicate that there is some support at the committee level for a further discussion, see if there's any real taste for it at the board of supervisors level and let it set there rather than putting it on the CAO's office, since the reality is that there wasn't the political support to implement it last time. And if that still doesn't exist, then we're pretty much spinning our wheels no matter what we do. Is that a reasonable way to move forward? I'm saying nodded heads. So I guess just to, to, to finish this discussion that we would ask the CAO's office just to communicate to the Board of Supervisors that this topic was discussed and there is some interest but we feel that it is appropriate for the Board of Supervisors to uh, initiate you know, a modification to our historic pattern if in fact that's their, their desire. Is that a fair communication to make to them? Okay, any public comment or Ernie, go ahead. I, I think it's a great idea. It would be almost impossible to implement in my opinion, it's uh, the way it is and it would take away from other funding so I, I think I think it's a great idea, but I think it needs further to, some functional implementation. Okay, Scott. Yeah, what I'd like to do is just um, get together with them or have uh, staff get together with them, just purely for a fact-finding expedition. Um, if if it was something that they were going to modify um, for on our behalf, then I wouldn't be comfortable with that. It should be our decision. Yeah. Okay, so I'm hearing, at least at this point, I'm, I believe we have a consensus that we would ask the CEO's office to communicate to the Board of Supervisors the, the existence of this discussion and let them decide if it's got enough horsepower at the board level to be worth any time as far as exploration further. 
Is that is that a motion, Chair? Well, I, the chair isn't going to make a motion, but like I said, that that's just kind of the sense of the chair. I don't know if that's a legitimate mechanism, uh, given our operating rules and so on. I guess we could have a formal motion to communicate our uh, some level of interest to the board. That probably would be a lot cleaner. Is that's is someone motion. willing to make a motion to ask the CEO's office to communicate to the board of supervisors uh, characterization of this discussion? to see if there's any interest at the Board of Supervisors level for carrying the discussion further. Do we have something? Go ahead and make that motion. Okay, we have a motion from Scott. Any, is there a second? I'll, I'll second it. Okay, a second from Nicholas. Any discussion of the concept? Any public comment on the concept? Great. Go ahead, thank you. Um, okay, so am I muted? No. So I just wanted to say that we've gone down the rabbit hole from what I was talking about. <laughs> you know, I this had nothing to do with the Board of Supervisors. I don't know how all that got go. I started to see it going the wrong way. I this was something that was just brought to me by two different public safety agencies as how do we how do we ask for money when we don't have a project in mind, but in the middle of the year, some horrible thing happens and we lose some major thing in our department and we need to replace it. We don't have any money. You know, it, it's that kind of thing. It's not, this was, it had nothing to do with Mike Wilson or the board of supervisors. So, I mean, you can certainly talk to them about it, but they don't know that this is coming because they're not the ones that brought this up. Does that make sense? Okay. That, you know, this this had nothing to do with Mike Wilson or, I mean, a couple of years ago, he brought it up. And if I had to call it something, I wouldn't call it a micro grant, but I did just because, just for a point of reference. But if you're a tiny little agency and you hardly have any money in the middle of the year, a huge piece of, say, equipment dies or, you know, your communication system goes down and you have no money to replace it, they're wondering, you know, they, they feel like, there's no way for them to come and ask for money at that point, which there isn't. But um, it, so this had nothing to do with the Board of Supervisors. You can ask Sean to, to go and have a meeting with them, but they're going to be surprised because they have nothing to do with this. They didn't know anything about this. This was just me being approached by a couple of public safety agencies. That's all. I just wanted okay. to say that. Mr. Robertson. Uh, uh, thank you for clarifying that, Ginger. Uh, can I ask if those are fire agents? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Sean. You're muted, Ginger. I said, are those fire agencies? No. All right. Uh, <laughs> You're safe. Because there, there's definitely <laughs> no. ways to deal. You would with know. That. I'm sure. Th I'm sure uh, you would know. Yeah, I was going to say there are definitely ways to deal with that through the fire chiefs if they were. Right, but but some of these independent agencies they don't have that. And, and they are public safety agencies and their communities are wondering why they don't get the money. But the truth is at the beginning of the, of the funding cycle, they didn't need this thing, but now they, now they did or they do and they're running around trying to find things. So I, I was just throwing it out there. Is there a way? And it sounds like the answer is no, and that's okay. I'll help them figure it out another way. I'm good at fundraising, but I told them I would bring it forward and I'm done. But this has nothing to do with the Board of Supervisors. Don't, um, don't bring up stuff you don't need to. <laughs> you know, I think that's my, you know, that would be my, my thing. And Nick, you know, I, I understand your concern too. It's the same, same kind of thing. But I'm always happy to help your people too if you find somebody that needs money. There okay. is money out there. All right, thanks. I also, my understanding was, you know, we kind of, even if we had come to a consensus about this, we would need to send it to the board of supervisors because at the end of the day, we are only making recommendations. They're going to be the ones that are making the final decisions about uh, how money is allocated. So anything we do to change or modify our process needs to have support for them. Um, and so I do, that's why I do support this going to uh, the board of supervisors, even as a, a conversation, uh, because then we find out, well, at that end process, uh, is this something that's even worth us discussing? Okay. Is there any public comment on the motion? Okay, seeing none, 
All those in favor of the motion to communicate essentially the uh, existence of this conversation to the Board of Supervisors indicate by raising your hand. Oh, okay. Hold on, Chair, just a second. I, I need to tally the vote. So Ginger, Scott, Bob, Nick, Sheriff, Sean. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six yeses, Chair. And I was going to be no. Okay, six yeses. Okay. Okay, so in essence, the, the CEO's office will communicate the existence of this discussion, the board and the board can take any action that they see fit to respond or not respond as they, they choose. Okay, and just to confirm, Ernie, you were a no vote on that? I'm a no, okay. I'm a no. I hope the board of, well, board of Supervisors is less confused on it though. Okay. You have trouble implementing it. Uh, Next item would be D7 review of the 2122 application and recommendation process and consideration of process changes needed uh, relative to the application. Uh, the application was included in the attachment materials. So, anyone like to speak to this topic? Bob? I have a couple suggestions. The first one is dealing with including the complete language from uh, the ballot measure in the application so that potential applicants can go ahead and see exactly what they need to go ahead and adhere to. Because that's the kind of litmus test that we're judging all these projects to. Does it fit within the ballot measure? And it would seem that replacing the five or six bullet points that Sean has up there on the screen with the uh, actual ballot measure would go a long ways to helping make sure that any applicant understands exactly what the Measure Z program is about. The second thing, and I don't quite know how it fits into the application, there's a reference to length of attachments, like one page attachment for this, one page attachment for that. And it seemed that last year when I was going through the applications that a lot of people didn't adhere to the page limit maximum. And we got a lot of applications that had a lot of pages attached to it, a lot more than what the application seems to suggest you're allowed to attach. So perhaps that needs to be clarified as far as how long are these things supposed to be? How many pages should be attached to it? Thank you. Okay. Thoughts of other committee members? Ginger? Um, I, a couple of years ago, I think it was two years ago, we had um, an agency that applied and they wanted us to fund their director and an assistant director. And they were new, they had never applied before. They, they were really a new agency. And they had, as it turns out, cause I talked to them afterwards, they had been, it had been recommended by another nonprofit agency that they asked for Measure Z money. The other agency has never received Measure Z money. So didn't really know the process. They were just throwing it out there. So this agency asked, and then they said, you know, well, our whole budget is, and it was a very small budget and we need a director in it. And so we turned them down because they did not really meet the, you know, the standard, but the young man came up and he said, I want to thank you all. This is a learning process. I want to learn as much as I can. I'm new at this. I appreciate your feedback. And anything you can do to inform us how we can be better the next time would be great. And I really appreciated that a lot. So I called him a couple of days later and I said, look, you know, I know it's really hard to apply for these kinds of things because I'm, I'm a fundraiser. And I said, but one of the things that you may not know is that when you, and you may not, you know, we don't normally fund positions like that anyway but but I but I said when when you ask for that you you need to know that 
that the money that's covered in there is not doesn't cover workers comp it doesn't cover you know all the what do you call those the the other you know, other expenses you were just asking for the straight pay but you would have to come up with the rest and he said oh i had we had no idea we have no money i mean how would we ever do that and so I said, well, I, you know, I'm just telling you any application for any funding agency, they normally don't cover all of the extra expenses that go into hiring people. And so he was really grateful and we had a nice conversation and they didn't apply last year, but, but I think that somehow that needs, what's the name of that? What's the, the payroll roll-ups, the what payroll roll-ups. Well, there's another what do you call that? Anyway, there's another name um, of extra, you know, the extra money that you have to provide when you hire somebody. And I think that's called personnel overhead. Yeah, maybe. Benefits? These, pardon me? Benefits? Oh, because it wouldn't be a benefit. Workers' comp is, is something required by law. Anyway, I'm, it, that's not important, but I'm just saying, I think in the application, that needs to be somewhere on there that, you know, if you are applying for a position, you need to have the money to cover the, you know, those things. Because I don't think we cover that normally, do we? It depends on the applicant. A lot of, a lot of the applicants do in fact include it, yes. If, but they have to include it in their in their ask, right? Yeah, certainly. They were, they were just asking for the straight hourly wage. Right. And I said, well, you, you have to, you know, that wasn't going to be enough. And so they said, oh, we have no idea. Yeah. So try, to try to keep the discussion a little bit focused, if you don't mind, let's go back to Mr. Bronco's two specific suggestions first and try to discuss those. The first was the substitution of the actual ballot language for the summary that's currently included. Would people want to speak to that proposal? There's currently kind of an interpretive summary of the types of uh, elements. Mr. Bronco was suggesting that we would be better served to have the actual ballot language. Uh, is there support for that modification? Mr. Hansel. I agree with that. That's not a bad idea. Other thoughts, other committee members positions? Uh, I would support that as well. Okay. Well, can we see what version we're talking about? Are you, are you guys seeing the, the ballot language right now or are you seeing a spreadsheet? John, Mr. Quincy is sharing a, a screen sharing a citizens advisory committee application element. That's kind of, I would call it an interpretive uh, presentation of the, of the ballot language. Are I'm you looking at, it's I'm looking at the bullet ballot. points. I'm not looking at the wording of the ballot. Okay, just for clarity, I'm seeing a, a screen that's titled Citizens Advisory Committee on Measures of Expenditures, and then it has a series of bullet points that outline typical uh, types of programs and so on. Is everyone seeing that in the screen sharing uh, mode? I can share yes. my screen, Sean, if that um, is helpful. So Mr. Bronco's suggestion is that we replace this I would call it interpretive presentation with the actual ballot language. Is there support for that potential modification? I heard Mr. Hansel speak in favor. I heard Nicholas speak in favor. Ernie's quick giving me a thumbs up. Um, quick clarif uh, clarification question. Would that be the ballot language or the ordinance language itself? Well, Mr. Bronco said the, the ballot language. So I, I'm not, that's a good point. The ballot language is now on the screen. So if, um, if you could confirm if this is what you're talking about. Chair Zima, I have a question. Certainly. What, what additional information is there between this ballot language and what is already on the form? Mr. Bronco, it was your proposal. Do you want to speak to that? Uh, certainly. Uh, when you look at it, there's slightly different uh, language that's being presented in here. 
for instance, there is discussion on illegal marijuana grow house enforcement prevention. Um, I got to toggle my screen here to look at the other one. To, to I can pull up both. So 24 hour sheriff's patrols aren't on there. Uh, oh, there you go. Got both of them together. I can um, do like a split screen. My meeting controls are in the way. So let me try to. So this is the language that's on the application now, and this is the ballot language here. And my thought was that this is what the voters, we, we always seem to go back to what the voters voted for and that we're upholding the, the will of the voters when they approved the tax measure and that this is what the voters saw when they went to the polls and pull the lever in favor of it. I still don't see what that difference is besides a couple of words missing. The, the intent is what I read more or less the same. Sorry. Just I'm want to make sure all bases are covered with it. Problem here. Perhaps to ex expedite the discussion, Mr. Bronkel, would you like to make your recommendation as a motion and then we can see if it has support? Certainly. Um, I'd like to move that we replace the existing Measure Z narrative with the Measure Z language from the ballot. Okay, is there a second to Mr. Bronkel's motion? Once again, is there a second to the motion? Okay, I do yeah. not. Can, can I just make a comment really quick? So the ballot language from measure Z <clears throat> is slightly different from the ballot language in measure O. Oh, yeah. They both talk about public safety services here and uh, measure O specifically calls out repairing deteriorating roads, um, emergency communication systems um, that I don't believe were specifically called out in Measure Z. So I would like clarification on exactly which ballot statement we're talking about. Okay. Well, procedurally, let me just move. We have a proposed motion. I do not see a second. Uh, and without a second, obviously it dies. Is there a second for Mr. Bronkel's motion? Okay, seeing none, I would say that that issue is put to bed. Your second proposal, Mr. Bronkel? The second proposal deals with the number of pages that applicants are turning in with their applications and that it seems that applications oftentimes include excessive number of pages. Either we're having a limit on the number of pages that people turn in or or not. And I'm just not sure how that's, it's not clear what the page limit is if there is one because people aren't necessarily adhering to it. Mr. Robertson? Perhaps the issue was that uh, we made that change last year for uh, reasons of efficiency and applicants may not have adhered to that. And I think we gave a grace period or at least some grace in still accepting those. But I would say the, the page limit is pretty clear. It's one page for those three uh, additional pages. And I definitely would like to keep those that way. Just since I don't have it in front of me, is it bold, italic, and underlined so that it's highly noticeable to the applicants? I'm just wondering if we could achieve your goal by highlighting it in either, like I said, bold, underlined, and italic, or color, or doing something to make it 
stand out in the application directions? I guess it's more of the question of what is uh, staff going to do when they receive applications that exceed these one page limits, if those applications will be rejected or will they be forwarded on? Is there, if the grace period's expired, maybe we need to bring that to people's attention. It's probably just more of a policy issue of what do we do when we get these applications in that aren't adhering to what the requirements are. Staff, what is the staff's thought? Yeah, we can, I mean, we can work on technical fixes and things like that to, remind people that only one page, you know, it's a one page maximum for the narrative and one page maximum for the prior year results. Um, I'd be hesitant to throw out, completely throw out applications, but if, um, if that's something that your committee wants to, wants to do, we can do that and bring it back to your committee and say that we've thrown them out or something like that. Okay. Also, Chair, um, Sheriff's hands have been up for a little while. I'm sorry, Sheriff Hansel? Yeah, I just had a couple other things that I would like to propose changes. So I don't know if we wanted to move on. Uh, let, let's deal with this one first and, and put it to bed one way or another. So is the committee comfortable? Uh, I, you know, Mr. Blanco raises a fair question. Do we in fact establish a hard limit and say that Applications that do not follow the instructions explicitly are, are eliminated from consideration. Mr. Cole. Um, I want to maybe propose making a statement saying um, additional pages beyond the limit will not be included in considering the application. I don't want us to eliminate an, eliminate an application, but perhaps we limit what we're evaluating to what we've asked for. Other committee members' thoughts? Ernie? Yeah, I, uh, I think that we ought to give a great stress to limiting the amount of pages they write, but I'm willing to go through it because, it, you know, these, some applications are complicated and some are clear cut. And I, I, I read them, I get annoyed, yes, but I read them. But I think that there ought to be like bold prints and be as brief as you can. The other thing that I wanted to say about, we're talking about what wording should be on the application. I've always given great weight to the way this measure Z and O was sold to the public. And that was police protection, fire protection, and medical response in that order. And that was given like, the heaviest consideration in all the advertisement, all the promotion. And I think to be fair to the public, we as committee members need to keep that in mind when we're issuing these recommendations because they really, really did sell it heavily on those three issues to the public. And uh, the wording is a lot different on the ballot. Hey, Ginger, I think you are next. Um, oops, yeah, I was wondering, could we, um, like if, if an application comes in and it's way too long, can somebody just give them a call and say, you guys need to come in and get your application and fix it before the deadline, because it's way too long? I mean, some people just, you know, they feel they can't, but when they know they have to, they will. Is that something we could do, or is that too much to ask? What do you think, Sean? No, I, I, I think we can, I think we can do it. Um, it, you know, it'll, from there, it'll just be up to the applicant to, you know, to modify their application. Um, yeah. I mean, we're not LA, we're not San Francisco. We're not, you know, we're a small community. We need to remind people that they have to follow the rules. And sometimes people just say, well, I had to say that last three paragraphs and you can say, well, you got to come in, get your application, redo it or resubmit it. Cause you know, that's the way it is. I don't know. It's a teaching, it's an educational process, sort of. And if I might jump in, I, um, just from looking at applications in the past, I think that we could, we could potentially do something like that. But if they don't, within the deadline, as we mentioned, what would then be the option or what would then be our choice of staff? Um, would you want us to present anything past the first page? Would you not want to see the application? How would you suggest 
if we were to go that way. Because I think that those are the pieces that would, we would need to apply fairly. Yeah. I'm hesitant to suggest a more more complication to the administrative flow. Yeah. Uh, and then you get into all these timing issues. Well, I wasn't notified in time that I had to shorten my application. It just, it seems to me like you're introducing a whole bunch of complexity that just doesn't serve any purpose. For me personally, I'm very capable of taking a look at the application and personally downgrading it a little bit if I think they haven't followed the rules. And I think that discretion exists for each and every committee member. Uh, so I personally am in favor of a little less formal process. Uh, you know, let, let people express themselves as they feel necessary with them understanding that we are going to put some sort of valuation on their compliance with our request. Ernie. Yeah, I, I bow to the wisdom of Chair Zemer. I yeah. agree. Okay. So have we, I, I'm not, it's not clear to me that we've come to a consensus on this. Uh, I, I've heard staff say that they're going to try to emphasize just via mechanisms within the application uh, and stress this. Are, is the committee comfortable with that level of attention to this detail? Okay, I'm seeing the majority nod. So we'll consider this one uh, dealt with. Sheriff Hunsell, you said you had some suggestions? Yeah, just a couple of things. One, uh, Laura Canzanari's name is on this. Um, so, and then um, I would like to, on the, on the application itself, I think it's, I think we should put a checkbox uh, on the front of it, that the very first line that says, you know, that this application is essentially uh, renewed from the previous year. Um, so it's, it's just a carryover. Um, and, and so we know right away that this was previously funded. Um, and so I think that's a, a good thing to know that it's the same program as the previous year that was funded, that was approved. And so it's just kind of, so we can kind of compare it to last year's application, make sure that essentially is the same. And, um, and so that would be my recommendation, two, two of my recommendations. Okay. Thoughts on uh, Mr. Hansel's suggestions? I saw a lot of nodding heads in reference to the checkbox. So my suggestion would be that that has support and would be added to the application just to expedite it. Any objection to that modification? Okay. So we would add a checkbox fairly early in the application indicating that it is essentially a renewal of a previously funded uh, application. Any other discussion regarding Mr. Hansel's suggestions? Any public comment or Bob, go ahead. To further elaborate on Sheriff Hansel's concerns about the names, there's probably additional names that need to get updated and changed around in the application as well. And I think it should just perhaps be more of a blanket review and update all names and phone numbers as necessary in the document. Certainly, yes. Okay, any public comment? I see Ginger's hands up also, Chair. Oh, I'm sorry, Ginger. Go ahead. So I wonder if we could put a little sentence underneath all that and say, I understand that I can only put one page additional <laughs> to my, you know, and make them check that as well. Yeah. yeah. Just a thought. I know it's one less thing. At some point, we have to assume some level of competency on our applicants, I think. Although I, I, I stipulate that once in a while, I'm surprised by what we receive. Okay, other proposals for modifications or any changes to the application? Okay, I think we would consider this agenda item complete. Next would be the proposed 22-23 uh, fiscal year meeting schedule. Staff, would you like to speak to this? Yeah, so um, included in the agenda are just the uh, meeting schedules from prior years. Typically, your committee um, meets once in January to um, authorize opening the uh, application process, and then you begin meeting in uh, the first week of March or the first or second week of March. 
to start um, receiving the applications and evaluating them. And then there are um, meetings as necessary throughout March to determine recommendations to uh, send off to the Board of Supervisors. And so uh, based on just prior um, meeting schedules, I added a, or staff added a um, potential meeting schedule for 2022, and that is January 13th. And then um, in March, beginning March 3rd, and then at least two meetings and then more if needed and then having another meeting around this time next year to go back over fiscal year 21, 22 and get an early look on uh, 22, 23. Okay, any comments, concerns, or conflicts from committee members? Okay, so am I correct in believing that we accept the schedule as proposed by staff? Yeah, I just need a, just need a motion, Chair. Okay. Is there a motion to accept the proposed schedule as submitted in the uh, agenda? I'll so move. Motion by Mr. Cole. Second I'll by second. Mr. Myerson. Any discussion? I'm sorry, who was that second from? Ernie. Any public comment? Okay, all in favor of accepting the schedule as proposed by staff? Opposed? Okay, uh, item D9, uh, as you're all aware, probably we received two, two communications from the Humble Deputy Sheriff's Organization uh, addressing what they see as uh, lack of uh, expeditious and efficient use of the Measure Z monies. Uh, Mr. Barney was made aware of, Mr. Barney is the apparently the current representative of the Deputy Sheriff's Organization. I communicated with him about three weeks ago and made him aware of the meeting. Is Mr. Barney in attendance? And if so, would you like to speak to the committee? There you go. I'm bringing. Uh, what is his name? Jamie, yeah, I see a Jamie in here. And yeah. I brought them in as a panelist. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, thank you for uh, having me. That's quite a meeting to sit through. I appreciate all the hours that you guys have put into Measure Z. And the biggest reason the letters went out, the reason I'm here is the uh, number one priority for Measure Z. I, ideally, 24 hour uh, deputy coverage throughout the county um, wasn't happening in 2014. And right now, in 2021, it's the same, if not worse. So, our uh, members are concerned. Why is that? If that was one of the biggest reasons uh, we went out and supported, implemented, and um, put Measure Z on the ballot and then got a pass, but we don't see the results that it should be. Um, as Sean said earlier, we are uh, working with a board and we may be coming to um, a resolution, but um, I do appreciate throughout the meeting how everyone has went back to focus on what is Measure Z for, what's it about, and um, that gave me encouragement just watching the meeting. Are you still there, Mr. Barney? Yeah, yeah, that's my spiel. Okay, just to help me understand the context of this a little bit, uh, I'll, I'll be real honest with you, the, the tone and the, I would say, highly inflammatory language that you used in both letters struck me as a little bit unusual for an initial communication to a public body. Uh, boiled down to its essence, you, you say, and in fact, the quotations are that we're throwing $70 million down the drain. What is your proposed alternative for the for the mechanisms that the committee should undertake or, you know, I, I understand the ultimate goal that you have, but I'm confused in the sense that you seem to suggest that the committee should involve itself in the internal organization uh, of the entities to which we grant money and, and by some mechanism uh, force them to take a different administrative and organizational uh, approach than they have in the past. I've never viewed that as being part of our charge or our responsibility. 
but your letter clearly suggests that that we should be involved to a much more explicit degree in the uh, operations of, of the awardees. H help me understand how you view the function of this committee and why you make statements that we've totally failed and are derelict in our duty and so on. Um, well, I realize the ability the Measure Z committee has is limited. But if the number one priority is to have 24 hour coverage in Humboldt County and we're going backwards, um, you can't involve yourself in, in how that's done. But I think you can question why it's not being done to those that may be able to. OK, other committee members have comments or questions? Mr. Burke, what would your proposal to the committee be? In other words, you're clearly unhappy with the mechanisms and the, the approach that we have taken. What specific alternatives are you suggesting that we should undertake to, to address this problem that you've identified? Um, maybe you can talk to those that do have the ability um, to make that change or to address a problem because else, um, if the number one goal of Measure Z is not happening, then something needs to be done. You can ask questions. That's what I would suggest. So, so let, let me be just completely candid about this. You've been, your organization has been pretty uh, direct and uh, harsh on the administrative uh, structure of the Sheriff's Department and so on. So you're suggesting that we should in some way uh, chart a new course for the sheriff's organization and or deny them the recommendation of the funding unless they make that, that change in course. That seems to be the suggestion your letters convey. Not the sheriff's department, board of supervisors. Okay. Any other committee members have questions or clarifications, Mr. Cole? I, um, I don't want to make too much of a statement on this one. Um, I, I do want to say I felt, um, I just want to clarify, um, the Sheriff's Association is currently in negotiations with the Board of Supervisors as to their contract. Is that true? Yes. I felt that the re public release of, of that letter, um, I felt its timing was questionable within that context. Um, what I would say to you is you're more than welcome to submit an application to this organization. And we absolutely hold the, the goal of public safety and the intent of Measure Z and the, the integrity of our process um, to be our, 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 our highest mission. Um, and so, I, I would like you to reconsider how you view this committee and and in hopes that perhaps you may participate in the future. Point taken. Ernie? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say I would fully support seeing the sheriff's deputies be well paid. And I would also say that personally, I think that we need more staffing out there. I think we need, need more deputy sheriffs on duty. And the, the abrasive of the letter doesn't bother me a bit. Like my, I got round slick shoulders. Uh, and when you're frustrated that you're not getting the funding and the help and everything that you need, I'm, I'm just saying this personally, this is not, I, I have, no recommendation on this committee to the Board of Supervisors or anything. I just want to say that I would like to see the deputies funded adequately, whether it's too much or too not. I We've spent Measure Z money training deputies to see them go somewhere else. And I don't think that's right. I, I don't think it's a fair use of Measure Z money to train somebody and lose them. So I... Uh, Deputies may be hor horribly overpaid, but if we don't have any, what good does it do us? Uh, I think that 
I'd encourage the Board of Supervisors to work with the deputies to see if they could come to some resolution where they could fund the deputies where they were happy and where there would be more deputies want to stay on here. Uh, from what I understand that the deputy sheriffs can get paid a lot more going quite a few more places or quite a few different agencies than they're making on the sheriff's department. And I, I trust Sheriff Hansel to fend for you guys. And uh, I, I hope you get a raise that you're happy with and we need deputies and that's all I've got to say. Okay, Mr. Barney, just a question to help me understand and quantify this. Just for the sake of discussion, so I have some sense of the magnitude, if, if the current proposal that your, your organization is forwarding was accepted by the county today, how much additional expenditure above the, the current amount would it require to meet the, the request that you're currently carrying as your negotiating posture? Uh, I wouldn't have numbers for you on that. The only numbers I have is um, what Ernie was saying. We're training deputies to go uh, work elsewhere. So whatever it takes to um, stop that or even um, whatever it takes to bring in laterals from other agencies is what I would propose. And it, it probably has to come more from the board Okay. in this committee. In, in some of your, your public comments, you made reference to Mendocino County being one of the agencies that's, that's taking employees away from Humboldt County. How, how, in general terms, how much more does a Mendocino County deputy make than a Humboldt County deputy? Um, I think it's two and a half years ago, they got a 29 to 30% raise um, on their application. They probably say, uh, come work from Mendocino where deputies can afford to live where they work. I think uh, Humboldt, we can still afford to live here, but it's getting much, much harder. Um, for a starting deputy or even a deputy that's been on for two or three years to uh, afford to buy a house here for one. Okay, uh, the, the reason I, you know, we, we fund generally in the range of seven to seven and a half million dollars of, of the measures e-money goes on an annual basis to the sheriff's organization. I, I'm just trying to understand in general terms, if the committee were to recommend a, a X amount above the, the 7 million, I'm just trying to understand if that's going to be functional as far as helping the retention problem. I, I worked in an agency uh, for 20 years that was a training agency for other fire departments. So I'm, I'm highly familiar with, and I was a chief officer in a department that constantly watched my people be trained and go out the door. So I, I have some sensitivity to that argument, but it still boils down to the fact of how much money is it going to take to make us competitive? So maybe uh, maybe that's a discussion we'll have with Mr. Hansel and the, and the Board of Supervisors, because there is certainly limited capability within the fund. And quite frankly, I'm not sure there's there's the public appetite right now to funnel even more than the seven and a half million in the sheriff's organization. But if there was some incremental amount that would make us more competitive and at least stem the flow, that might be something that you know, I would be willing to consider as a committee member, but we, we need to get some quantification of what kind of general numbers we're talking about. Sheriff Hansel, do you have any any comments or can you help us understand uh, kind of the magnitude of this? Absolutely, Chair Zemer, thank you. You know, what it comes down to is recruitment and retention with the Sheriff's Office. You know, Measure Z was brought about, you know, seven years ago because we were struggling with our staffing levels. We had six essentially deputies covering all 4,000 square miles of the county. Uh, we are a little better off today, but still there's areas in the county where we don't have 24 hour coverage because of our staffing levels. We're 20% down right now. And, and so it's one of those things that we've totally revamped our whole recruiting program. Uh, but what, uh, what Sergeant Barney is talking about is that one of the things that we had to do over the last three years is send people to the police academy. And so by the time you put the application out there, it takes essentially uh, about a year to get them out on their own and be, uh, you know, a, a solo beat officer. And, um, and so that is a long time to realize, you know, how you can make up 20%. And, 
and we've been having us uh, about a 50% washout rate as of you know sending people to the academy. So it's a lot of taxpayer money that's that's going to waste essentially if, if those people are never making it onto the street. And so what what we would love to be able to see is a competitive wage to be able to pay the deputy sheriffs. Um, and, uh, and so we can actually appeal to some of the other areas in Northern California to bring lateral deputy sheriffs here to Humboldt County to live and to uh, provide public safety services. Um, the difference is, as opposed to a year, we can get someone on the street within six weeks, six weeks, if they're a lateral deputy sheriff. And um, so the way that we do that is we increase our salaries. Uh, we have um, recruitment bonuses and, um, and we have an area that, that would be productive to work in. So that's, that's one thing that, um, that I think Sergeant Barney is, is making it known to the Board of Supervisors. Um, I think what, what, what Sergeant Barney would also recognize is this committee has supported the Sheriff's Office, you know, 100% of the time. And uh, we felt supported, we know we're funded, um, but ultimately the goal of Measure C was to increase rural patrols, rural staffing, and some of those essential services, public safety services. And you know, I hate to tell the taxpayers that we're still collecting this money and we can't fill the positions. And uh, so that's, that's one of the reasons why you know, this, this appeal, I think with Sergeant Barney has, has gone all the way to the Board of Supervisors. If, if, if we were to just take the TCE for Mendocino and your agency, what kind of differential is there? About 20%. Okay. Any other committee members have any comments, discussion? Mr. Barney, would you like to say anything else? No, that's it for me. Thank you. Appreciate uh, being able to speak to you. Okay. Mr. Cole? Um, I'm... I'm not opposed at all to finding ways uh, to promote retention, um, but I think one thing I'm coming up about coming up against is is this not really the function of the negotiations that are happening currently? Um, I, and, and if I'm wrong, please please tell me that there's a way that our committee can engage or make recommendations about how we affect retention through this fund uh, that is not covered by the negotiated, by the, the contract um, that's being negotiated. Is that, that's the end all be all, isn't it? One, sure. more question, one more question for the sheriff, if you don't mind. The proposals that have historically been brought forward to the committee envision essentially filling, you know, uncovered slots and so on. I, I don't remember the number, but we were funding essentially in the range of 25 to 30 positions at some point in time. Has, has you, have you and your administration considered uh, revamping the proposal to the Z committee so that say, and I'm just picking these numbers as an example, say 50% of the measure Z funding would be used for filling open positions and 50% would be used for the kind of wage improvement that Mr. Varney is suggesting as a mechanism to improve the retention instead of focusing all the money just on, on just the un, un, unfilled positions, has there been consideration of you know, adjusting that and directing some toward the retention side of the discussion? Uh, it hasn't been a part of the discussion. Uh, we were kind of waiting to see what, you know, that is something that we can bring up at budget time, which is uh, essentially four months from now. Uh, we're hoping and optimistic that, that through the negotiation process, that they will see uh, a raise that that will you know will benefit the association. So that's what we're hoping for right now. But that is definitely something when it comes to budget time that we will you know if necessary you know that's something we can definitely look at because freezing positions uh, to all allocate more money for raises has been something that they've done in the past. Okay. Any other committee discussion? Any member of the public like to comment? Sergeant Barney, any comments you'd like to leave us with? No, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. At this point, that completes the agenda. Uh, and I would uh, make the meeting close at 3.47 p.m. We will see you all on the 13th of January, hopefully face-to-face. Uh,